Yeah, some days I feel unfazed Like when I'm with my friends with a cut raise hey. And on Monday, I got a gun raise Suicidal, do a die until hump day Then I go right back at it like an automatic More drinks, more songs, more beats to rap I need a shrink, I'm gone More time keeps passing No watch, no thoughts at all Just a hat, new era Wet my P's and nose O's Need a fillies with my orange and black to feel home From Citizen Bank back to Camden Yard Took the tail of two cities And trust we go hard Trust we go hard Yes, we go hard You said we go hard I said we go hard Rockin' my Bob Cousy Stockin' up on the loose If the lyrics come easy But the life is a doozy And yes, I'm choosy And no, I won't settle But I still take pop off Over that kettle Cause I'm talking bigger picture And yes, I'm gonna hit you with the... In case you didn't already know, Australia is a good country. It's so good in fact that Melbourne and Sydney are constantly ranked in the top 10 most livable cities. But as you may have noticed, Melbourne is currently ranked third. And that means two things. First of which is the fact that we didn't have enough money to bribe them for first place. And secondly, there's two cities that are better. And you guys already know that Big Daddy Yorick has a few PhDs. And that means when it comes to research, I'm the right man for the job. You see, the the reason that Melbourne is only third most livable city in the world is because of the traffic. But there's been one question on everyone's mind since the dawn of time. And that is, what causes traffic in the first place? But one day, 33 minutes into my 47 minute drive to my local KFC that's only 2 kilometers down the road, it finally clicked. They wear high vis, tight shorts speed dealer sunglasses and have a bad temper no it's not apprentice carpenters it's cyclists. With a top speed of roughly 25 k's an hour and an addiction to riding in the middle of the road instead of the bike lane, no one causes a traffic jam quite like a cyclist. And that's why I've made it my personal mission to put an end to cycling. But you see, I have to use a different approach this time. Because it's 2023, if these grown men want to dress up in tight pants and bright colours to go hang around with other men wearing tight pants and bright colours, they are more than welcome to. So in today's video, I will end cycling by using facts, reason, and logic to debunk every argument that cyclists use to justify their actions, while also offering solutions and alternatives so that they can still have their fun and not get in my way while I'm on the way to KFC. Anyway, that's enough waffle, let's get into it. The first argument that we'll be debunking today is that cycling is cheaper than driving. But the fact is that in some cases, cycling is actually actually cheaper than driving. When I was 15 years old, before I grew up, I used to ride bikes as well. And that resulted in me quickly finding out how expensive cycling can be. When I was 15, buying a bike was not an option. They just cost too much money. So what I used to do was find bikes on the side of the road, bring them back to my house and stash them down the side. And whenever I needed to go somewhere, I'd ride that bike to my destination, leave it leaned up against a tree. And if it was still there four hours later, when I decided to make my way home, that meant that I didn't have to walk. But the problem is, if you're not finding your bikes on the side of the road like I did when I was 15, cycling is going to be a lot more expensive than driving. And here's why. This bike here costs $20,000. $20,000 is a lot of money. So to all the cyclists out there watching, how can you justify spending $20,000 on a push bike that only comes with two wheels and one drink holder when you can spend $500 on an AU Falcon with six months rego and get four wheels plus one in the boot two cup holders and still have 19,500 bucks left for three months worth of petrol you see it just doesn't make any sense even on the lower end of the spectrum this bike here is a thousand dollars with a thousand dollars you could still buy that five hundred dollar au falcon and you'd still have five hundred dollars left over to put enough fuel in the tank to get halfway home so now that i've completely voided the argument that cycling is cheaper than driving i'll get into debunking our next argument and that is that cycling is more convenient than driving for some reason you cyclists love to bang on about how convenient cycling is but that's where you're wrong Cycling has to be one of the least convenient things ever invented. If you get a flat tire in a car, you can quickly pull over, change 
change the wheel and continue on your merry way. But if you get a flat tire on a push bike, you'll have to carry the bike the rest of your journey, and that means you have to walk around in public with a bike over your shoulder, dressed up like a shrink wrap traffic cone. But let's just say you got lucky one day and actually made it to where you were going without breaking your bike in 50 pieces. Now you have to find somewhere to park it. With the car, all you need to do is find a parking spot and lock it. And if you didn't choose to park in a tow away or no standing zone, when you come back at the end of the day, it'll still be there. But with a push bike, you have to find somewhere with maximum security. The problem with leaving a push bike anywhere that isn't gated and locked is the fact that if the public can still access it, it's free game. You could put 43 bike locks on your bike and lock it to a telephone pole at the front of a police station and there's only a 10% chance that when you come back at the end of the day, it'll still actually be there. If you leave any sort of push bike on the side of the road, no matter how many locks you put on it, there's always a 100% chance that some junkie will spawn in with a pair of bolt cutters, cut the dog loose and make a beeline for cash converters. But it's alright, because when your bike inevitably does get stolen, you'll be able to find it and buy it back from either Gumtree, Facebook Marketplace or cash converters. Now that's what I call convenient. Now before we get into the alternatives that I've come up with for cyclists so that they get off the road and I can drive to KFC at more than 17 kilometers an hour, I'm going to give you a few more reasons why cycling is bad. The classic cyclist outfit is a helmet, overpriced speed dealer glasses, a shrink wrapped on lycra bodysuit and velcro shoes. At the end of the day, it is 2023 and you can wear whatever you want, but you can't convince me that there's one person in the entire world that looks good wearing this. Alright, that's enough criticizing of the cyclist fashion choice, because another thing that makes cycling almost impossible to be practical is the weather. When you're driving an AU Falcon, if it starts to rain, you have these two little things on the windscreen, you flip a switch and you're good to go. But if you're a cyclist and it starts to rain, you better run for cover, because if you don't, you're gonna get drenched. But when it comes to cycling, there's only one real weather condition that you can actually enjoy it in, and that is when it's dry and sunny, but not too sunny, because then you're gonna overheat. But the thing is, with Melbourne weather, you never know when it's gonna be sunny. You can check the weather app and it'll tell you that it's going to be 10 degrees and sunny. But what that actually means is that in the next 10 minutes there's going to be torrential rain, 15 thunderstorms, and then 30 minutes later when the rain stops it's going to be 40 degrees and you're going to end up with sunstroke. But then by the time the ambulance gets to the side of the road where you've fallen off your bike due to heat exhaustion, it'll be raining again so badly that while you were lying there unconscious you got washed three suburbs away. So by now you've probably realized that cycling is a bad idea and that you should get out of my way when I'm on the way to KFC. But there may still be some cyclists out there who want to be able to ride their push bike without inhaling diesel fumes from the Nissan Patrol that just overtook them while rolling coal at 480 kilometers an hour. And that's where I present my solution. It's called the exercise bike. On the exercise bike, you can live out your fantasies of riding three kilometers an hour in the middle of the road without any of the risk of becoming a victim of road rage. With an indoor exercise bike, you can control the temperature and you can even set up a TV to watch while you ride your exercise bike so that you can watch my videos while you exercise instead of being forced to watch every tradie in a 20 kilometer radius flip you off. But if you don't want to use an exercise bike and you enjoy getting out in the open to ride your push bike, luckily the government's come up with a solution and that's called bike lanes. It's come to my attention that many cyclists do not know that bike lanes exist. What's the point of us spending this money if you're not going to use it you f you see, for many years now the government has been building bike lanes. They're located on the side of the road. Even though these bike lanes have been around for many years, most cyclists still choose to ride down the middle of the road at 20 kilometers an hour. So now that Uncle Yorick has blessed you with this wisdom, next time you decide to go out, ride your push bike and clog up all of Melbourne's traffic, don't. And with the problem of cycling solved, it's time to end. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share if you'd like to hear more teachings from the prophet of your ack hunt. And as always, a shout out to all the people who made a donation to the charity of my bank account. And once again, another special shout out to DerpNZ for emptying his wallet into my bank account with this $100 donation. I just spent it all on a brand new Lycra bodysuit. And don't forget to buy a t-shirt, you dogs.